thank you, all of you, for being here. I heard that you heard four of these not so long ago, so I will try to keep my remarks very brief. When I was asked to come address the EAIE, I was particularly enthusiastic. Actually, when I was asked to come address the EAIE, I had no idea what the EAIE was. <laughs> but I turned, as you do, to Mother Google and quickly found myself enthused by the thought of addressing an organization addressed, devoted to the internationalization of higher education. It occurred to me that day that they are exactly the two things, internationalization and higher education, that have been in so many ways the dominant themes of my life. Internationalization, because my family comes from and lives absolutely everywhere, Nigeria, Ghana, Scotland, Saudi Arabia, the US, the UK, and higher education because I was raised by a hard striving Nigerian mother, the African version of a tiger mom, what I like to call a panther mother. I don't know if any of you have ever been around any ambitious Nigerian mothers. Indeed, ambitious Nigerian is a bit redundant, but if you have, then you'll know that for them, higher education, like oxygen, is a basic human need. The bright side, though, of that kind of indoctrination is that I grew up loving school. I was raised not only to aspire to attend university, but to believe in university itself, in what happens when bright young people come together to learn about themselves and about their world. I was blessed to study at Yale. My mother was a bit disappointed that it wasn't Harvard <laughs> and that at Oxford. And I met in both places the people who remain my dearest friends today, especially in England, where I met grad students from all over the world, I came to see myself differently, to feel that I wasn't so strange after all. There, unlike any place I'd previously been, were so many people like me, from Australia, Germany, Togo, Hong Kong, both at home and homeless in this world. As some of you may know, I gave a TED Talk on this subject on the ways in which we are best understood as locals rather than as nationals. I gave that talk two years ago, but had been thinking about it for decades. Like many of you here in this room, I'd guess, I've lived a life that has given me ample opportunity to consider that wonderful question, where do you come from? I have heard some version of that question at least once a day, probably more, since I was about the age of five years old. I do not exaggerate in the slightest when I say that in my life, I have been asked where I come from a minimum of 10,000 times. You'd think that after hearing one question 10,000 times or more, I'd have come up with a halfway decent answer. But my questioners are never satisfied. Where do you come from, they ask. Which country? And the truth of the matter is, I don't know. I was born in a country called England. I was raised in a country called America. My mother is said to come from a country called Nigeria, was born in that country called England, and has lived for 15 years in a country now called Ghana. My father comes from that country called Ghana, was born in an English colony called Gold Coast, and has lived for 30 years in an 85-year-old kingdom called Saudi Arabia. I spent three years in a country called Italy and now live in a country called Germany, a country, incidentally, that didn't exist when I was in grade school. The country called Ghana didn't exist when my Ghanaian father was in grade school, neither the country called Nigeria when my Nigerian mother was born, and so forth. Countries, for me, have always seemed like slippery little suckers, but it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I finally understood why. I'll never forget, at the beginning of my MPhil in international relations, discovering the concept of the sovereign state. It was 2002, the United States was waging a second war with Iraq. I'd gone to England for graduate school in large part to learn why. 
Newspapers and textbooks referred to those entities, America, Afghanistan, England, Iraq, as eternal, natural, singular, almost anthropomorphized things. But I was unconvinced. Who was this America? The soldiers, the president, me, waging war. Why, I wondered, did we speak about countries as if they were singular things? When, at Oxford in 2002, I learned of the peace of Westphalia, that is, when I learned that the concept of the sovereign state had a beginning, 1648, and therefore might one day have an end, I felt this kind of bodily relief. I was right. Countries were ideas. Hence, my trouble with where do you come from. Countries are imaginary. Human beings are real. A real thing can't come from an imaginary thing. A real thing must come from real things. Real things are the humidity index, the friends we cherish and see every week, the family we cherish and miss every day, the coffee we drink every morning. Real things are that bar we love, the faith we practice, the team we support, the smells, those very particular smells that remind us instantly of home. Real things are my dad's couch in New Jersey, my favorite neighborhood, Osteria, in Rome, my mother's plants in Boston, then in Accra, my love of these places and people. These things are real, what I call rituals and relationships. Countries are not. It is the real things, the real people, the real experiences that shape who we are. All identity is experience, I've said, and all experience is local. The sum of our local experiences, this is where we're from. When I started thinking about the internationalization of higher education, I thought about this, of what happens when young people studying abroad assimilate new localities, new rituals, new relationships into their identities. After I gave the TED talk, I heard from countless people who wanted to know whether they could consider themselves locals of this or that place. It was kind of sweet, the idea that I could give someone permission to be local somewhere, but telling to understand where the hesitation came from. Many of these people had studied somewhere and had come to feel like a local of that place, even if they were no longer living there or had lived there only briefly. This, for me, is the power of speaking of locality rather than nationality. There are no time restrictions on how a place enters our hearts. A year in Florence will not make a New York native Italian, for example, but it can shape her rituals and relationships such that she feels like a local of Firenze. Studying in Delhi will not turn an Englishman into an Indian, but he may forever after struggle to explain why he prefers to eat with his hands. Studying abroad can add a new layer of locality to the experiences that shape who we are. It can also change how we understand who we're not, that is, how we come to see difference. Perhaps my biggest quibble with the language of coming from countries is that it forces us to believe that we are fundamentally different from those who don't come from our countries as well. If we look closely, we find that the nation functions in personal identity primarily as a marker of difference one that obscures the meaningful sameness of human experience. In the most benign sense, this is a question of context. If I ask you where do you come from in the United States, you might say Texas. If I meet you in France and I ask you the same, then you might say America. National identity is a bit like color. Our perception of it relies on contrast. The risk is that looking through the lens of nation, we can tend to see contrast where none really exists. Most students who go abroad, in my experience, discover this. When a Dutch student arrives in Spain, she may likely think of herself in precisely these terms. I am Dutch, they are Spanish. I am tall, they are, let's say, less tall. I have blonde hair, they have dark hair. I am this, they are that. But as she begins to adopt new rituals, siesta, tapayar, and form new relationships, she may start to see herself differently, not as Dutch, a fixed identity, but as a local of Amsterdam and Madrid, a flexible identity shaped by fluid experience and not by rigid borders. 
Why does this matter? Why does it matter that young people, through study and travel, two of my favorite things, come to understand themselves as possessing flexible identities? I've always believed on a gut level that the world would be a better place if more people studied outside of the countries in which they were raised. But why? What is the value of the work that you do? What is the worth of internationalized higher education? What does it do? What does it change in the student and in the world? I'd like to be honest with you. There are those who would argue nothing. There are those who would say with dismissive impatience that internationalized higher education is by its very definition a matter of privilege. It is a privilege to have access to higher education at all, the more in a foreign country. I'm lucky to be standing here talking about how multilocal I am and thinking about how to make more students multilocal too. But how does it actually change anything in the world? I was forced to confront this question when I gave my TED talk. For many people, the idea of multilocality was enlightening, a refreshingly accurate way to describe their experience in the world. We can't answer the question, where do you come from either, these supporters said. But many vocal others weren't so moved. Poor Taye Selassie, they said whose life has been defined by internationalization and higher education, who has the passports to travel and the means to study, but who doesn't know where she's from. Don't cry for me, multilocal, they sang. And I had to reflect on their critique. Was I just preaching to the choir, the internationalized, educated choir? Was I merely strumming the pain of a kind of global middle class? If I come here today and tell you, yes, the work you're doing is so, so important, getting students to study in different countries, am I merely beating that same cozy cosmopolitan drum? When the world is racked by refugee crises and resurgent tides of racial intolerance and terrorist attacks, what does all this talk of internationalization really mean? Does it matter? Yes. My humble answer to you is yes. In 2015, according to the UN Population Division, the number of international migrants, that is, people living in a country other than where they were born, reached 244 million, a 41% increase compared to the year 2000. Now, I should say I love the word migrants because it's never applied to people who fly economy comfort. <laughs> so I should tell you that amongst those 244 million, only 2 million are refugees. 244 million people living away from home, wherever home is or wherever home was. This is the reality of our world, movement, flow, mobility. I think we could see that here. Now, in Germany, whenever I ask people to raise their hands, Nobody does. <laughs> it's a very stiff culture. So I always start by saying, raise your hand if you're breathing. Okay, okay, good. You're with me, you're with me. Now, raise your hand if you have children. Okay, a good number of you. Raise your hand if your first child was born in the same city as you. A few people. Raise your hand if both of your parents, your mother and your father, were born in the same city. Also just a few people. Raise your hand if you live in the same city in which you were born. Also a few people, much fewer compared to the number of people breathing. And raise your hand if you like Game of Thrones. Okay, good, just checking. I wanna make sure you're with me. <laughs> What I am asking you to do, or applauding you for doing, is to give the world's young people, Europe's young people, Asia's young people, the American young people, for the love of God, African young people, the kind of experiences that will prepare them to live in the world of this room. This isn't a matter of comfort or privilege or Instagram photos of tapas. This is a matter of revolutionizing the way we see the world. The old way says we come from countries. 
And just as we come from these countries, they come from those other countries. And as they come from those other countries, they are not like us. And as they are not like us, we needn't to treat them with empathy. It is okay if they are oppressed by their countries or devastated by civil war or left to die on the Mediterranean Sea, for they are not like us. A worldview based on countries is a worldview based on borders, and a worldview based on borders is a worldview based on indifference. As soon as something can be said to fall outside of our borders, then we don't have to care anymore. This is the old way of seeing the world. What you are doing, beyond a kind of feel-good project, is helping to create a generation of students who reject that worldview. Our time will be remembered is being defined right now by the movement of people. The new way of seeing the world says, these people are just like me. They have their rituals, they have their relationships, they face their restrictions, they come from the same real human things that I come from. Our experiences may be different, the locality in which those experiences occur may not be the same, but we all come from human experience. We all come from the same place. There are no fixed borders within ourselves and no fixed borders between us. A student who, through study and travel, learns to see herself as local may also cease to see herself as national. A student who has ceased to see herself as national can then question the logic of nationalism, can challenge the hostility of nationalist rhetoric and exclusionary national policy. That student, the student you work with, will become a voter, a citizen, a community member, a thinker, capable of seeing the flexibility of her own identity and the fundamental humanity of others. That student with whom you work, that student gives me hope. When I look at the world, at the places I've loved, including the United States and Europe, I see a world expanded by movement, but also a world closing in. Borders growing tighter, walls growing higher, tensions growing stronger. Young people who can resist this closing in impulse are desperately needed right now. And what better way to teach young people to open up to the world than to send them out to go see it? For those of you who like Game of Thrones, you are creating an army of the enlightened, an army of the internationalized, an army of the open-minded, multi-local, post-national, wide-hearted thinkers, trained to challenge closed-mindedness, prepared to fight for openness. In the grand scheme of things, with all that's going on in the world, does this really matter? Does the internationalization of higher education really matter in the end? My answer to you, I say again, is yes, absolutely yes. Thank you.